the midwife is in. Call the midwife. Tonight at 7. Don't like everything I see. On a brand new episode Looking of Eleventh and Grand, internationally renowned singer songwriter like Jim Salestrum. Look ahead. Joined by his son James, he shares his touching head. music and notable life story. Somehow we will make it back home. Jim Salestrum, November 11th on Eleventh and Grand. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Good evening. You are tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very beautiful and dynamic campus of Montana State University and coming to you over the Montana public television system. I'm Jack Rieselman, retired professor of plant pathology. I'll be your host this evening. We're going to have an interesting program tonight, but you need to make it even more interesting by providing questions for our esteemed panel members tonight. Let me introduce the panel here this evening. Way on my left is Bruce Maxwell. Bruce is originally a weed scientist, but now he calls himself a fancy name, agroecologist. Did I get that right? You got it right. Okay. Our guest this evening, Bill Kleindell. Bill is an interesting individual. He works a lot with wetland systems, and that's a really interesting topic. If you have questions about wetlands this evening, hey, it's a good opportunity to find out the benefits of wetlands, and we're going to stress a little bit how they interact with agriculture. Lori Krasenik, Lori is our insect diagnostician. We do have a few stored up insect questions from previous weeks, but if you have some this evening, the phone number will soon be on the screen. Call them in and we'll go with that. An old friend sitting next to me tonight, Toby Day. Toby is a horticulturist by trade. He's been around here a lot of years. We invited him back tonight because he hasn't shaved for the last month. So <laughs> it's always good to have you. And answering the phones in the studios tonight, Nancy Blake. Nancy's been here quite often. Thank you for coming in, Nancy. And remote tonight will be Deanna Miblin. And if you have questions, start phoning them in. Before we go any farther, Bill, tell us what you do here at Montana State University. Well, I've been involved in wetlands and river ecology since the early 1990s, late 80s. I was a wetland consultant for a lot of years and then came back and got my PhD in uh, uh, 2014 and studied river dynamics and how humans and ecosystems interplay with each other, kind of a social ecological systems based around rivers and wetlands. And most of my work is focused on, there's, there's a, a, an executive uh, order that came out in the early 90s called No Net Loss of Ecosystem Functions and Values. And most of my work is trying to measure what are ecosystem wetland functions and what are wetland values in terms of the services they provide to maintain human well-being. So that's what keeps me busy. Yeah, I, I can believe that. And I've always yeah. been fascinated by wetlands. I, as you probably know, I like yeah. to hunt ducks. I like to sit yep. in wetlands. You know, are they important to agricultural production here in the state of Montana? Is there a good relationship between wetlands and ag production? Well, there's, they're immensely important. It, depend, it depends on, on if you, let's say you have a confined feeding unit and you've got to deal with all the waste. Then there's ways of integrating constructed wetlands into, into your... Uh, bioswales in your lagoons to help reduce the um, nutrients and the fecal coliforms, etc. But if you don't have that, and you just do egg, you just do irrigation, then you want to have wetlands filter out sediments. They provide long base flow into the summer. They uh, they help reduce uh, 
uh, impacts to, to pumps by getting rid of the, the suspended load in, in ditches and streams. They provide an immense amount of habitat, which uh, keeps us busy with our hunting and fishing in, in Montana as well. And bird watching and, and everything. And bird watching, yeah, let's I, not forget yeah, the birds. Wetlands yeah. are kind of unique. We'll yeah. get back to, we have a couple Facebook questions that have come in. But before we get there, Bruce, this one came in this evening and they would like to know what it takes moisture wise to break the drought that we have here in Montana. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, Certainly because our patterns have changed uh, in recent years to more fall precipitation and spring precipitation, you might have noticed that most of the state has not received much fall precipitation yet. It looks like we're going to go right into winter. We are seeing a prediction of, of uh, higher precipitation in the winter. Will that be enough will be the question, certainly. It turns out that, that winter precipitation can help um, uh, probably do a, a more for filling our aquifers and, and our groundwater, but not, uh, uh, but it takes a lot. And the, pr the problem we're seeing is that, that with early snow melt, we're just losing that component of storage that helps do all this recharge because we get this big flush of water that goes out of the state and, and we don't get to use it. So that's a, that's a big thing. And, and then we get these really hot periods earlier in the summer than we've ever seen in the past, dries things out really rapidly. So we've had a couple of cases like that here in the, in the last few years, and that's, uh, that's worrisome. <laughs> well, Hopefully we'll get a lot of spring rain following a good snow year, and, and we could recover pretty well. But if you've noticed that uh, reservoirs and things are lower than they've ever been in most of Montana. A lot so of the marshes it. that I'm familiar with. Bill, uh, relative to that, are most of these wetlands groundwater charged or are most of them from rain and snowfall? Well, let, let me, can I get to your question in a second? Just follow up on what Bruce sure, said? Sure, absolutely. So when he talks about earlier snow melt in the spring, so if you can imagine how rivers rise and fall and it's get a, a, a seasonal hydrograph, right? We get a peak flow at the top of snow melt and then it goes down as, as the river goes back to its normal bed low, or a bank fall and, and then below into its low flow. As it goes down, it passes through something called a recruitment box for cottonwood. So cottonwood seeds off, you know, and it seeds off right at the same time that that river is going back down again, right? And it's, cottonwoods have adapted to our seasonal snow melt conditions. And if, the, if that hydrograph is moving further into the spring, it will go down and then the, then the cottonwoods will drop their seeds and the, all those seeds will desiccate and we'll start moving from our cottonwood riparian forests into things like, like juniper forests because we're starting to lose that ability, to, that evolutionary, um, co-evolution relationship between snow melt and cottonwood seedlings. That's a really important yeah. part of, of riparian health. Russian olive is another one. Russian olive just increasing. jumps right in there, yeah, because... Okay. Uh, have a different recruitment window. And I have a question here from Russian Olive that I'll get to in a minute, but Toby, so, uh, let oh. you answer this one. It's a quick one. Uh, when's a good time to separate uh, rhubarb? To separate rhubarb? That's a good question because I have never actually separated rhubarb. Um, I would say right now it'd probably be a fine time. Um, you could also do it in the spring. I mean, it's pretty hardy. Um, okay. Just make sure that you have, uh, so they, they kind of have these underground nodules, uh, rhizomes, I would guess. Uh, you want to make sure that you, know, you have three or four uh, on those when you, when you um, separate those so that you have a good robust plant. I've seen too many times where people take too small of a piece of rhubarb and it usually dries out and desiccates, so make sure you have a pretty good size. All right. And while you're at it, this question did come in from Townsend last week. I jotted it down. They would also know the best time to separate peonies. Uh, peonies could be done in the fall also. Um, I don't think there would be a problem doing it in the spring. The biggest thing about peonies is make sure that they're planted at the uh, right level. If they're too high, they'll uh, dry out. If they're too low, they simply won't flower. So whatever the level was that you've taken those plants and you're dividing them, you make sure that it's at the same level. I get a, got a lot of questions back in the day about why my peonies aren't flowering after I separate them. It's really because you planted them too deep. So Do you mulch deep. them as well? Uh, if you mulch them, you can actually cause them to uh, 
to stop flowering. So yeah, it's, oh, uh, oh, well. you want to make sure that you're not mulching them too deep. Okay. This is one for Lori, and I like this one here because I don't know anything about it, but here we go. Susan from Whitehall. It's a question for Lori. How can we note the difference between a marminated stink bug versus a regular stink bug? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> so she's talking about the brown marmorated stink bug, which is we haven't, uh, brown marmorated stink bug is an invasive pest and uh, it is, it has spotted antennae and it also has six spots on its last segment called, called its abdomen and it looks, it also has, doesn't have rough, uh, the, the second segment called the thorax doesn't have uh, rough edges. So basic, but basically if you look for the spotted antennae and then the six white spots along the, the abdomen, that, that's a brown marmorated stink bug. And they are here, they're in, they've been confirmed in Billings and in the Flathead Valley okay. and expect them to be all throughout the state. Why are they called stink bugs? Uh, I should know the answer to that question, but I really don't. I don't know what the stink factor is. <laughs> okay, I'm just curious. I've never figured that one out. Is there a thing called a stink factor? I, well, I just kind of made that up. <laughs> My entomology now I'm interested. colleagues are probably so, going to slap me. Why, why, why are we concerned about this new stink bug? The stink bug it, it has been a, a really bad pest in the uh, on the Atlantic coast, especially for apples. So it is pretty. It, it has piercing, sucking mouth parts. So it, it's really uh, ruined a lot of the apples. Mm -hmm. And as it's moved west, it's been more of a yard and garden pest. And it has over 300 hosts. So it usually kind of overwinter, not overwinters, but likes to reside in woody ornamentals. And then it'll come in and feed on on a, a bunch of different vegetables and fruits. Do we use traps? The traps are, are good for monitoring, but they're not good for, for, for actually doing anything to the population. They reproduce like crazy and their numbers really, really start to skyrocket. Mm. So it's hard to use traps to, for, as, a, as a control method. Mm. Okay, thank you. I learned something this evening, which Great. is not hard, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't learn about the stink factor, no, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bruce, last week, this person from Glendive said that uh, Jane noted that the Canada thistle was not native to Canada. Now they're curious about Russian olive and Russian thistle. Did they come from Russia? I don't know um, about Russian olive. Russian thistle, I think, is a Eurasian species. So, um, you know, it, it could be Russia, Eastern Europe, okay. common. Uh, but Russian olive, that's an interesting one. I'm not positive about that. I, I don't know. I know it's not Look native it here, but... Yeah, it's not native. No. Okay. Can I ask a question about Canada thistle? <laughs> so we're here in the Gallatin Valley, and when you drive around the Gallatin Valley, you see just fields, fields of Canada thistle. And I curse people <laughs> because my garden, which I usually take very good care of, has Canada thistle all through it, and I don't know where it all comes from. It's a city it flower. It has to be from from flowers. So, what would when would be a good time to spray Canada thistle? Oh, well, as a uh, because it's a perennial and it has an incredibly large uh, underground root system, rhizomes. Uh, it um, it's very difficult to get any kind of chemistry, any kind of herbicide you spray on it down into that system and really have an effective kill. The reason is because if you put enough on to see it die, it, it, it actually dies too quickly and it doesn't go out to that root system. You put on a lot less than you think you should or, I mean, there's labeled rates, but go to the bottom of that labeled rate it will more likely to have a much larger effect and get down through the system. Now, the fall is the time when Canada thistle is delivering its, is, is recovering that, that root system. So definitely after uh, the day length, it's a day length controlled thing. So after uh, the first of September is good. After the first frost is even better. So that's the best time to, to spray when the rosettes are still there. They won't bolt any longer. That's the best time. Again, don't put it on too strong. If you see those rosettes die right away, then you're not doing any good. Much better to put a low dose on. 
I agree. Uh, I got a couple questions here for Bill. Uh, one from Haver. Uh, can you please talk about the role of beavers building and have helping to maintain healthy wetlands? Wow, that's that's a great one. The, well, beavers are the you know the great engineer, oh, okay. and uh, came from so uh, all of our. What's really interesting, you think about rivers, right? That first people like first Europeans that came out to the to the west were the beaver trappers. Mm -hmm. They took all the beaver out, made them into hats. And then right behind those guys were the river ecologists, right? So they, <laughs> they started studying rivers and they said, this is, this is how rivers look and this is what they should look like because no one's been out here yet. So this is what a pristine river looks like. But the reality is that we, everything, most of the things that we know about rivers and riparian areas and wetlands in the West were all post beaver. So they were already already damaged. And, and people are just starting to come around to that. And, and, and what has really changed in the idea of restoration, especially around rivers since the 1980s, is, is it went from everything from the wetted edge down about the fish. And now it's about outside of that and engaging with the floodplain because that's what beavers did. They would increase flooding into the floodplain, bring in that carbon, drop the sediment down, and you need to have that the river and its floodplain as a system to have a healthy in-stream system so you can have healthy fish. So beaver are really important. And now there's lots of work being done for artificial beaver structures to try to bring rivers that have been incised and they put in these artificial beaver check dams essentially and raise up the, the sediment and raise up the, the river to gauge with the floodplain to bring in willows and, and uh, young cottonwoods and then have beavers attract beavers into that area. Okay, interesting. Will beavers ever break their own dam? Will they break their own dam? Uh, I don't think so. They always just make bigger dams. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, when, they, when a beaver dam breaks, they're attracted to the sound and the hydraulics, and they go right to that spot and fix it. Huh? Yeah, they're very attracted to those things. So when you're doing restoration sites that you have beavers there, you've got to work around that thing by some beaver control structures. So if you saw one broken, it's probably a human involved. Yeah, or the beaver's not there anymore. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, I'm going to get back to you in a minute. We have a quick one here from Libby. For Toby, uh, this person transplanted established lavender plants to a new location. This spring, she gave them new soil, but they died. Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, there could be a million different reasons of why they would die. Um, I mean, it's... it's that's a really hard question to, you know, to answer without knowing more about how it was transplanted, whether it was watered properly. Um, lavender really actually, I mean, it's, it's pretty indestructive, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it could have been put into an area where uh, there was some herbicide residual that was in there. Um, it, there's just a whole host of things. Uh, I wouldn't actually know without more information, I guess. You didn't even cop out on that one. <laughs> it's just a tough one to answer. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, so back to you from Glen Dive. This person has uh, wet areas on their land that hold water in the spring, but they are dry for the rest of the year. Are those considered wetlands? Uh, it goes back to your earlier question about where the water comes from. So uh, out in eastern Montana, we've got a lot of vernal pools, so spring pools. And that's snow driven. They, there's usually in the sediment themselves, they're, they've been cemented probably through ashfall a long time ago and, and there are little depressions and then they get filled with snow or spring rains and then they fill up with, with water and then you get, you get, to have a wetland, you need water, hydric soils, and plants that are adapted to live in hydric soils. So those vernal pools are, are considered wetlands if they're wet for a certain percentage of the season and they have those three parameters. And they're super important to, to uh, pollinators and to habitat in the spring and to birds moving through the area. Yeah, that brings up a question. I've been around here a long time. We used to have a major issue with something called saline seeps in this state. Mm -hmm. They're not as big a problem anymore. Is there a reason for that? And also, were they considered wetlands or wastelands? 
<laughs> well, that's good. I mean, if you go back in the history of wetlands, wetlands and wastelands were pretty you, they're probably tied together quite a bit. Mostly because people didn't understand the value, you know, the types of ecosystem services that wetlands provide. But saline wetlands have been in Montana long before European expansion. It was it was a, a thing for sure, and it has to do with um, you know the mechanisms of of uh, saline it has a lot to do with irrigation in the uplands moving through and moving the salts through and uh, boy I had a, um, my friend Russell Smith did his whole master's degree on it and, and I learned a lot about saline wetlands with him and how to decrease that saline component which is really you know make the land more usable again but we have whole ha halophytes you know we have a whole suite of plants that are adapted to live in those saline systems in Montana. I that actually are think we used alfalfa around the yeah. edges yeah. to suck up a lot of the excess yeah. moistures and that was somewhat beneficial. Yeah, yeah. But they are wetlands. Yeah, they're wetlands. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, from Laurel. Uh, <laughs> did the snowstorm last week take care of our hornet problem? You would think. Yeah, there's still some stragglers around. I, I, I think maybe with this Next snowstorm, if we have a little bit of a snowstorm in the next couple of days, I think that'll take care of them. But they'll still stick around, especially the western yellow jackets. Where we're out, I was out last week, they were out even up pretty high, about 6,000 feet. So they're not done yet, but they're going to run out of things to feed on, and that's going to be what takes that, that'll take care of them when they run out of stuff to forage How on. How do they overwinter? Only the queen overwinters, so the fertilized queens. So the, the, the workers will eventually just, just die and mm. after a couple of really, really hard frosts. Mm. So, but, but the queens have already gone to overwinter at mm. this point. Mm. I'm glad they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> they're just horrible creatures. Yeah, they're not much fun. No. And they love steak and hamburger and bratwurst and everything else so, when you're trying to eat outside. That is a good question. Are there different um, yellow jackets, ones that like meat type products and ones that like sugar type products? Because it seems like the same one that's eating my hamburger is also like on the rim of my Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, so they, they switch, I mean, they, they switch kind of in August, late summer to more sugary type materials to, to fatten up for, uh, provide resources for the queens. That are about to overwinter, but I mean they're they're scavengers. So in the in, I mean they feed on meat sources or uh, dead insects and things in the beginning, and and but then they they switch to to our type of food and stuff in the late summer to kind of help the queen get queens get fat. I have to ask Toby a question. You ever had one in your beer? <laughs> Didn't notice it. <laughs> no, well, yes, but I, yes. I I spit it out very quickly. <laughs> it's it does quickly. happen. It you does. have your sacrificial beer, so you just leave a little bit in the bottom, and then <laughs> let them. <laughs> well, I do know that I I uh, it was two years ago. I, I went to a local hardware store and got uh, the little packages that you fill with water, and and uh, they fly in but can't fly out. Yeah. And I probably caught about three to four hundred um, mm -hmm. in about a week. I was totally amazed. This year. I think we had maybe four pesky ones that were bothering me. So was it a light year this year? It was a light year compared to the year before, yeah. yeah. Is there a reason for that? I don't know, okay. yeah. I don't know why they were light this yeah, year. I would agree, they're nowhere near as many this year. Yeah. So, so do you switch the juice from a protein base to a sugar? For the trap, that, the traps that are available, it is, it's a, it's a lure, it's heptylbutyrate, and, and it is, I don't know what, oh, that, it's that's, different. it's different, so, but that's, you really want to get that out in the spring to try to trap the queens, but you can have it out all year and it'll still trap the workers, but, but, I, but it's the same lure that you use in, in the trap the whole time. Uh, okay. Good to know. Uh, Bruce, Patty and Seeley Lake. They still have napweed. Should they be pulling it? Is it too late to spray it? Thank you for calling Montana. Um, in Sealy Lake, I think you probably could get away with spraying it, but if we have another frost, then don't yeah. bother. No. Um, but uh, yeah, you can pull it anytime. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bill, this is from Allen in Missoula. <laughs> As a policy, I need to pull this up so I can read it a little better. <coughs> um, Got to find it here again. That's what I don't like about these things. <laughs> um, as a policy, should wetlands be considered waters of the United States and operated overseen through the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers? Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. It's we can talk about that for the next hour. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, if you go back, on, uh, I, I teach wetland classes, and I have I have an entire lecture on on waters of the U.S. So I'll try not to give it all right now. <laughs> but if if we go back to the Romans, uh, there they said that you can't own water like you can't own the air. It belongs to the people. Belongs to everyone, and that. That idea has moved through the Europeans and the British and then eventually into the United States. And waters of the U.S. is really should be seen as waters of the people of the U.S. because it belongs to all of us. But only waters of the U.S. belongs to all of us if it affects interstate commerce. If it doesn't, then it should fall under waters of the state, which is waters of the people of the state. And, and so when we have water rights, we have rights of use. We don't actually own the water, right? Um, but that water is belongs to all of us. So the question is, should there should there be waters of the U.S.? Is that was the question? But it's this this idea of what is under the jurisdiction of the federal jurisdiction or the state jurisdiction has been shifting since the Clean Water Act was signed in in the early 70s, and uh, the Army Corps oversees the permitting, but it's EPA that oversees the the Clean Water Act okay. and then in the state it's you know DEQ and Good DNRC. Interesting. Uh, it's so complicated. It is very complicated. And very dynamic. It's really shifting. It's There's a whole new shift going on with Waters of the U.S. Okay. As we speak. Thank you. Uh, yeah. okay, let me get that Lori, uh, Facebook yeah. question from Missoula. <laughs> okay, so How long will spiders spider stay alive in a garage? <laughs> <laughs> Forever. <laughs> <laughs> that really depends on the spider. So I think uh, most of the spiders okay. that end up in our garage are on a one-year cycle. So they will live till about now, and they will produce an egg sac, and then and then they'll okay. die in, in the next few weeks or so. Sometimes, if you have a spider like a black widow, they can stay in your garage for for quite a while. I'm not trying to tell everybody, scare everybody that they have black widows in their in their garage, but. Uh, spiders related to black widows in that family, that comb-footed spider family, uh, that they can survive for for the whole through the winter season. So they and, and hobo spiders can can remain in the garage for a little while. So it just depends on the spider. But most of them are programmed to lay an egg sac, okay. and the females will die at this point. Okay. Um, uh, question: Every year at this time, they planted garlic last year, uh, put two or three bulbs in a hole, didn't survived, doesn't say when they planted it. Some tips on when and how to raise garlic. So garlic you usually plant in the fall. You want to get it fairly established um, you know, in the fall. Is it too late to plant? Right now, uh, I actually just planted my garlic today, so it's not. <laughs> um, and and uh, yes, we, we can have some hard freezes that will kill it off. We can get some desiccation, especially if it comes, you know, if it's actually sprouting, which it sometimes does if you plant early, you can get some desiccation, which will actually go through and kill the plants, especially if there's no snow or any kind of snow cover. There's lots of things that can cause it to, to die. Uh, it could be just even a bacterial load or something that, you know, in the soil. The big thing is, plant it in the fall. Uh, if you see it coming up in the spring, you're good. Um, but if you if you don't, get it in first thing in the spring. These long summers we're having, you're gonna get garlic. Um, it likes lo a well-drained soil, so if you have a real high clay soil, it's not gonna do as well. Um, and it, it does like that drainage so it doesn't rot. That's gonna be the bigger issue, so. Okay. Um, Bill, this person would like to know is DU Duction Limited, which I'm a big supporter of, working with various universities uh, for wetland restoration, or is it doing it themselves? Well, I'm the uh, president-elect of Society of Wetland Scientists, and I think you and I had a conversation a couple weeks ago about Ducks Unlimited and how come there's not more of a, of a connection between Ducks Unlimited and Society of Wetland Scientists at least at these up meetings that we have. And that really made me think about um, the, the, the role of Ducks Unlimited in wetland science at, in its history. Um, I, one of my students this semester showed me a picture of a, a Ducks Unlimited wetland um, duck habitat that they built in Winnipeg that looks like a duck. Yeah. <laughs> Some great big lake that looks like a duck with an eyeball, it's an island. 
Um, in the early 80s, there was a lot of restoration, wetland restoration that followed that pattern. They're called duck donuts, right. you know. And, uh, and then, then wetland science and restoration ecology went in a different direction. So it used to be more wetter, more better, and now it's not, with not, not wetter, more better. So we have more emergent systems and things that aren't really 100% focused on, on duck habitat. But I think it's an interesting connection, especially how many, you have that number, how many millions of acres of There's duck been habitat. 15 million acres in North yeah. America of wetlands conserved through yeah. Ducks Unlimited. Yeah. Right. And I'm interested if the society that you're president of um, yeah. that interacts very much with DU. I, well, th I think it's a n natural. Yeah, it, it should be, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to look into it. I, I was thinking about, you know, the outdoor, outdoor, the economy in Montana, outdoor of rec, is $7.1 billion, that's with a B, $7.1 billion a year spent on, on outdoor. One billion dollars on aquatics, on on fishing and, and and boating, and then a little shy of that on hunting. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money generated in our state. You're right, and that yeah. doesn't even count the people that go out and watch the thousands of different types of birds yeah. and animals yeah. in these habitats. Yeah, and about 50 percent of Montana's birds use aquatic systems. Yep, that's yeah. pretty amazing when yeah. you think about it. Uh, <laughs> comment, and I encourage comments, folks. If you hear something that you'd like to comment on or disagree with us on, hey, send it in, call it in, and we'll try to get it on. The Yellowstone, Yellowstone Arboretum Curator at Zoo Montana says that the Russian olive came from southern Russia and eastern Asia. So we learned something there this mm. evening. And the next question, Karen from Townsend has worms in her apples. How does she avoid that? Oh, so that's probably the coddling moth. And if you're harvesting some of your apples, you're probably noticing that you have some caterpillars or some caterpillar damage in your apples. And it's it, so likely you're gonna have them again next year. So pick up all your apples. Sanitation is about all you could do this time of year. So make sure you, you uh, the apples that you're not eating, make sure you get all those up, up off the ground. And then there are a lot of things you can do non-chemically the next year. If, if, you, if, you, if it's just one tree, you can uh, wrap your tree with corrugated cardboard to try to trap the, the, the caterpillars in, in the cardboard before they, they reach adulthood. And you could uh, kind, of, kind of prune out your clusters of apples so they're not touching each other, so you're not spreading the, the worms in between apples. And, and you could also kind of bag them too to try to prevent any sort of damage to the, to the apples from the worms tunneling in there. So uh, caterpillars tunneling in there. And there are spray options as well too, but that's, you never ever want to apply any sort of spray after, uh, d during bloom. You, it's, we calculate that by something called degree days, which is a little tricky, but, but the goal, it's usually ends up being seven days to, to two weeks after bloom. Yeah. So. Uh, like Toby, I know you try to grow apples, but you have predators that seem to eat your apples <laughs> that I've heard. I won't mention any names. I, uh, I have predators from human to bacteria. So everything is trying to take out apple trees of mine. So, Do you spray yours? I do. And I, I got to tell you that I don't follow the degree model. I, uh, you know, uh, like most homeowners, I'm doing my best because it's really hard to do the degree days. Um, there was a lot of work that was do being done and probably still is up in the Missoula area. But Missoula's environment is different than ours. And when you look at degree days, it's all about temperature and they're usually a little warmer. Uh, I usually go with that um, seven to 10 days after bloom. Uh, which is difficult because some trees flower later than others, so you're constantly out there spraying. Um, and yeah, I have done it in the past. I have finally just got overwhelmed. Uh, first of all, I have a lot of perennials and stuff underneath the trees. I don't like spraying. And so I have just lived with it. And when you're um, just a homeowner and you're, you know, using apples, uh, you know, I use the core and the ones that are bad get chucked and the ones that are good goes into the apple pie. And uh, that's just how I've done it. And then the last part is, is if they're really bad, I just squish them. You know, and it's a little gross, I guess, that you have like worm poop. Is it really worm? I don't know what it is, but there's some brown stuff in there. Yeah, it's but I, worm. It's caterpillar frass is the proper <laughs> term. <laughs> Anyways, I think it just makes it a little spicier okay. cider, you know? It's all good.
<laughs> All right, enough of that. Uh, Lori, why have you up? Uh, they have a... I saw a couple of yellow jackets uh, under a leaf pile. Are these overwintering queens or workers trying to delay their death? Huh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, it's probably workers trying to delay their death. Don't know what else to do with themselves if they can't find anything to eat. <laughs> probably. Okay, uh, Bruce from Scoby, a Facebook question. If we have another summer like last summer, are the weeds likely to take over in the low areas that are usually wet, but mostly dried out last summer. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because of uh, the changing patterns in precipitation are are really what uh, is tending to define those low areas and wet areas in places like uh, eastern Montana, like Bill had mentioned before. Um, in in many cases, that there's no reason to think any particular weed will take over. Uh, certainly, as we've seen, and as these dry out, some of them turning saline uh, um, because of lack of crop, perhaps, in the surrounding areas. And as we go into more drought, people tend to fallow more. That brings on more saline seep. And so uh, you're going to see more halogeton and some of those kinds of species. Uh, in terms of weeds, kochia is, is one that tolerates that, that salt quite well. Um, uh, foxtail barley also tends to tends to come into those areas but will we see a lot more I don't think we're going to see more because then you know there's other species that can't do well yeah. <laughs> under the same sorts of conditions so when we get these drying out things and, and if we start to see more of these areas that were wet longer um, uh, in the past but they dry out earlier we're, we're looking at, at probably more saline conditions, especially if we start to fallow more because of the drought. So that's, that seems to be the universal answer to what I ask it any time I'm giving a climate talk, I ask farmers about if you have more than two years or you're going into a second year of drought, what are you likely to do? And they say, well, probably not pl plant that rotational crop, probably go fallow. And so I think that's one of those side effects that sometimes we, we, we don't realize is, comes along. Okay. On that note, we have another question that <coughs> come in about the drought, and this person has a wetlands, and it, while it's still wet, the water level has dropped, and the amount of the um, whatever that weed is that has uh, cattails okay. has come in. Hmm. Um, is that going to be a continual problem with drought, or is there a way to get rid of the cattails as the water level drops? Wow, cattails are usually, Bill, maybe you can answer this better, but cattails, I think they have to be submerged pretty much. They round. do, I think, but you know, <coughs> in deeper water they don't survive, but in shallower water they do survive. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I suspect. Yeah. You're going to see more cattails. Sure, as the sure. they'll move, they'll move in. Yeah, cattails yeah. is an obligate plant, which means one percent of the time it's found in uplands, but it it's always wet. Yeah, because it pumps oxygen down to its roots. It does all sorts of things to to adapt to live in in wet conditions. But yeah, as it dries, as as these areas are starting to dry up, the if there's cattails along the fringe, they'll they'll keep following that preferred depth, and. Uh, if we down. get back into a wet period and it gets deep again, will those cattails die? Yeah, or? some they don't. You know, I've, I'm trying to think about how deep cattails go. Maybe about a foot or two, and then they they don't like being that submerged. Yeah, I think well, you're right. Yeah, so yeah, they'll they'll move with the edge. But cattails will form a monocrop for sure. And if you, I mean, if you got to choose which monocrop you want, but bulrush maybe or or cattails. Yeah. I mean, if <laughs> right. or you know, lots of other species but well and on those outside rings yeah. typically you'll see them start yeah. to die off right even though they're expanding into the interior yeah, yeah, of, the, yeah. of the pond yeah they will they will tend to be a monoculture of of cattails if they take off though okay um we have a question uh for from libby for Lori. her cabbages were destroyed by worms uh they also appear to be eggs in the cabbage, which is probably aphids, I think. But uh, any idea what worms would destroy the cabbage? 
Well, there is a caterpillar, and <coughs> it's called the cabbage white, and it's a it's as a it's a butterfly as an adult, and then as a caterpillar, it is it's green with a, a yellow stripe on it. So that's one that's really common in cabbage, and and then we've had uh, we have the cabbage aphid too. So it definitely could have this could be two things going on there. Yeah, this could be aphid eggs that are in there because now they'd be in the egg stage. Are those the ones that are like really waxy and almost woolly? Yeah, the cabbage the cabbage yeah. aphids really woolly. They're li they're difficult to control because they're, difficult. Yeah, that waxy covering makes it hard to contact them. Yeah, right. so if you do have that caterpillar, and you, I would check next year, keep an eye on it because try to catch it early. They're, they're usually active at night. I've had a hard time. I've found the, the butterflies out and then I later in the season, but then f find a chewer and can't <coughs> usually find out who, who it is, but it's usually, the, the cabbage white's pretty common. It hits a lot of different garden plants too. All right, so aphids, about two weeks ago, there was, everywhere you look, there were aphid-sized adults that look very woolly. Were those aphids, the, adult yeah, aphids? Yeah, so that there were, we have several different woolly aphids that come back to their overwintering host. So we have mm -hmm. the, the leaf curl ash aphid that, that has this kind of bluish and looks kind of woolly. Then we have the, the woolly elm aphid and the woolly apple aphid that all will, they, they uh, will, it looks like they're swarming almost when mm -hmm. they're coming back to their overwintering host. So mm -hmm. that, that, that was happening for quite a while this year for two, two, two or three weeks. So any mm -hmm. one of those three types of yeah. aphids, but they do look, kind of blue and wooly and fairy-like. Yeah, very nice looking bug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, interesting comment from Whitefish, and you guys can agree or disagree with this. Caller believes the stink bug odor is the same chemical as in cilantro. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, need... I will well, find that out would... tonight. <laughs> That would mean that half the population loves the smell of stink bugs and <laughs> half the population doesn't like the smell of stink bugs and it'll be the ongoing debate of cilantro yeah. now with stink bugs. Okay. <laughs> I don't know either. It, it's an interesting comment, something to think about. Uh, Bill, from Bozeman area, this person has a <clears throat> full time, I got to bring it back up here, uh, seeping spring that flows into a minor tributary of Sourdough Creek. Does it have automatic state or federal protection, damage, blocking, or so forth? So, Well, you, this is back to your earlier question of where does the water come from. So we talked about the vernal pools, which are snow-driven and, and, and spring rains, and this one is a groundwater-driven system. And if it's immediately adjacent to sourdough, which is a tributary to a navigable stream, then it's very likely that it is under federal protection. Um, if it flows year round, it's going to be under state protection as well. So, um, so there are there. Are, so, if this person wants to do some kind of fill or action around that wetland, there's three things that has to happen. First, avoid it. Don't do it. <laughs> Second one is minimize your actions if you cannot avoid it. So you have unavoidable impacts. And the third is to compensatory mitigation for those unavoidable impacts. And there's lots of guidance that's provided by the state or the feds on how to negotiate those permitting, um, torturous permitting uh, pathways. But you definitely, 100%, should follow that path. Otherwise, you can get into trouble. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, question from Polson came in last week, actually, on Facebook. They have some property on the east side of Flathead Lake that burned right through the creek bottoms this last summer. Should they get out there and plant some grass seed now or do it in the spring? Yeah, that's a good question. And we, we always get a, a flush of questions after a fire. Uh, what should I do for, from landowners? And uh, usually the reaction is, I need to plant something. I know I need to plant something or else I'm going to have a lot of soil erosion either this fall or next spring and when the snow melts. And it turns out that um, that's fairly rare that you're going to have a major soil erosion problem. And especially around streams where you have a lot of woody and shrub species that will almost always re-sprout, but certainly our natives all re-sprout. They, they co-evolved with fire and so they re-sprout after fire and usually they'll do just, just fine. So, Planting a grass, unless it was grass before, 
is not necessarily a good idea. If you're going to plant grass, plant a uh, Montana species, a native species that are co-evolved with fire. And, and there are some over there. I, I would guess that mostly though know, you're talking about shrub kinds of species. So let them re-sprout, they'll be fine. I know it looks terrible when it's black and you're afraid it's going to, going to erode, but rarely do they. So the fact is, and, and, and that fire uh, was, was rapid. It did get very hot in places. I've, I've had a look at it myself. And um, uh, but those that, the resprouting ability of most of the species is is very good. So okay, hang on. <laughs> I, well, I have you up, and this came in a couple of weeks ago, and we haven't had anybody to answer. But since you're here, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> this person wants to know if grazing in forest lands is enhancing the amount of noxious weeds that we get in our natural forests. <laughs> Um, it can work two ways, it turns out. Um, certainly if overgrazed or where you get a real concentration of, of livestock, you can encourage weeds to come in. And, and many weeds are disturbing species and those, those end up being disturbed areas where you have a lot of open soil, you'll get weeds there. In the same way, um, many of our systems and even forest systems where there's meadows and things, there was, they co-evolved with species that were grazing those. And if you don't graze them, then they tend to get uh, litter packed. In other words, there's so much litter there that a lot of those species can't survive. So in fact, a, some moderate level of grazing can be a good thing. And, and really, they're, they're, in many cases, what it does is if you don't graze them, you'll basically get taken over by grasses. You'll lose all your wildflowers after a while, or not all of them, but a lot of them. And so it's a, um, it's a two-way street. Okay. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, overgrazing certainly has impacted in where we have uh, uh, grazing allotments. There's, uh, they're usually controlled by whatever agency is offering those, whether it's BLM or uh, Forest Service, and they check those periodically to make sure that they're not being overgrazed, and, and then they, they control that stocking rate. Okay, good answer, thank you. Toby, here's one for you. I love these unique questions. <laughs> this person from Somers has very large flower beds, and the last few months, many turkeys are nesting and digging in them. <laughs> she wants to know how she can deter the turkeys without hurting them or damaging their plants. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I'm not a wildlife management uh, person. Um, I'm sure just a fence would probably keep them out, but I know that they can fly, so I have no idea. Uh, get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question for Stephen Van Tassel. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a tough one. Most of the time when I see turkeys, whether or not they're domestic or, you know, native, uh, they're actually going after bugs. They're, they're actually doing good things in the garden. So I don't really find them being a problem, but I'm not in that situation in summers. I don't know for sure. It can be a problem. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Stupid turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and they are hard to discourage. They yeah. really are. Uh, Bill, from Silver Star, this person has flood irrigation that supports a lot of wetlands on their land. Uh, is there a concern about what happens to these wetlands if they went to center pivot? And I assume right now they're using gravity irrigation. Yeah, yeah. So, gosh, you know, you think about pre-Lewis and Clark, right? We have these really complicated valley bottoms with, with uh, braided channels and, and, uh, and rivers moving from valley wall to valley wall, and there's all sorts of wetlands integrated in that. And then as uh, European expansion comes, the ditches expanded with them, and so did mostly flood irrigation. That was the biggest source of irrigation. And what that, that flood irrigation does is it brings up the groundwater, Right, and then it moves laterally towards the stream, and then whatever wetlands are remaining are being fed by that that system. So you can see those wetlands going up and down with flood irrigation. And yeah, if we move to to pivot head, it's really efficient at water at you know providing irrigation for the target's crop. But that support of those lateral wetlands, I fear, will they'll disappear. And and with it, you know, like we said, you know, the birds and the animals that are supported, and then the billion dollar 
$7.1 billion outdoor rec industry is tied to it as well. That's a real puzzle. Because we want to be more efficient with our irrigation. We also want the inefficiencies of the leaky ditches and whatnot to help our systems. It's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, you know. Uh, yep. or double-edged benefit, you know, whichever you look at it. Yeah, it was a real interesting yep. study, I think, in the Beaverhead um, on the groundwater system, and, and when they started repairing the ditches or the canals, yep. um, they were having a lot of wells were dropping rapidly, and they were figuring out, oh, my gosh, it was because they had repaired the ditches. Yeah. That, that yeah. Those leaky ditches were, were keeping uh, those wells alive right. in, in many cases, which yeah. would only lead to also wetlands being right. being right. supported. So. Right. And we've adapted over the last 150 years, we've adapted to a new system, a human-made system. And if we change that, then those adaptions are going to start to become really wonky. Yeah. Um, it's pretty complicated. Yes. Water is, there's no yes. doubt about it. It's yeah. going to become more complicated. Especially in stream flows. That'll yeah. be a big part of it, too. No, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Toby from Basin. Can grass clippings treated with weed and feed put in a compost pile and used uh, next spring? Yes. So usually the weed and feed is 2,4-D, lasts for about most like three months and so uh, it doesn't really stick around. The composting does not break it down, but uh, it's, it, it has a half-life that is short enough that if you put it in the fall, by the time you put spring, it shouldn't be a problem on your grass clippings. If that's 2,4-D, what about Banville? Will that? Well, yeah, but you wouldn't be using Banville on grass clippings. You, that would probably be illegal. No, Banville does come in some of your weed and feeds. Does uh, it? Yeah. Yes, and you well, wouldn't want well, in it. Yeah. That might be, yeah, the yeah. label's going to tell you, but yeah, I mean, I, I do some spraying, especially for thistles, Canada thistle again, uh, on my lawn, and I put grass clippings in, I compost it, I put it back in my garden, I've never had a problem. That's 2,4-D. Yeah, it's just 2,4-D. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Banville label is dicamba, right, Bruce? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> From Swan Lake, uh, Lori, every year this person in late August has a bad influx of carpenter ants. What can they do to prevent this? Oh, we have somebody on the panel that's had a carpenter ant issue. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, first, I, 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 I would definitely want to make sure that, the, that, that they are carpenter ants. That they have, uh, but I, it's... The, the tricky thing with carpenter ants is you have to find out what the source is. And usually the source starts outside and it could be, it's part of their ecosystem or part of their, their biology to, to break, uh, you know, break down trees. And, and so anything, any decaying organic matter or uh, if there's a dead tree around the uh, carpenter ants, that's probably the source. Then they form these satellite populations and will move into the house. And so finding out where the source is, is is a big deal because once they set up populations in the house, that means that, that it's, uh, the populations have gotten pretty high. So yeah, finding the source is a big, big a deal. really old firewood in the bottom of your stack, mm -hmm. get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Was that your source, Bruce? Well, I don't know. We're, <laughs> we're, we're testing that theory. Okay. But I, I have a sense that there was certainly plenty of of carpenter ants in those yeah, yeah. logs that were down there in the bottom that never got burned. And so it's like, get them out, <laughs> get burn them. That's good advice. I'm just <laughs> curious, how do you identify a carpenter ant versus other ants? Well, there's the, they look a lot like a field ant and are thatching ants. They're also called mound ants. So I definitely have to look at them under the microscope. And, and the, the thorax, the second segment, has, is flat compared to having kind of a, um, kind of a divided segment in the in the thatching Send them to you. And Send them to me, yeah. <laughs> that works better. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I don't know by just looking at the pictures. Okay. Uh, from Facebook, it seems like there is an overwhelming amount of alkali popping up all over the state of Montana. Is this due to the long-term drought we've been in? <laughs> <Look at each other. laughs> you know, it could be. I, I think that, you know, I, as I already stated, it, it, it usually accompanies a lot of fallow surrounding a, a particular area, and that, you know, that's where we started talking about planting a crop in those places is really important, and and understand, you know, the, you're fighting a, a two-way thing here because uh, um, you don't want to dry out that soil too much. But most of the time, as long as you get a crop in there, you can can solve that, and the best one is alfalfa. Put alfalfa alpha in for uh, three to four years and, 
and your saline seep problem usually goes away. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lori, Mike from Chester contacted us during the week with an email. He had lots of aphids in the kale, and I happened to have them in the Brussels sprouts this year. What can you do about that? Yeah, I think that's what we were just talking about. Those are probably cabbage aphids, too. They can also get green peach aphids, but they are the, the cabbage aphids will definitely hit kale. They could be the, the most numerous aphids in the, in the kale, and they, I mean, they, they could just, their populations could get kind of crazy. And they have a waxy covering like we were just talking about, so uh, you definitely try to, any sort of weedy uh, mustards or any sort of uh, wild cabbage or anything, anything that's really in the mustard family that's, that's weedy or wild related to that, they'll overwinter in that, so make sure you get rid of that around your garden. And then try to, try to take it uh, early in the season, make sure that you try to, uh, there are insecticidal soap and there's a lot of different things that you can try on the on the aphids, but try to do it early before their populations okay. get pretty high. Bill, we got just real quick question. Are the wetland scientists, are they certified? We got a couple seconds. There's a professional wetland scientist certification okay. that you go through through the S Society of Wetland Scientists. All right. Bill, thanks for joining us tonight. Yes. A lot of good information. Bruce, good to see you as always. Toby? It was nice to see you, even though you haven't shaved again. <laughs> Folks, we'll be back next week. Uh, we're going to look at biological weed controls. Thank everybody for joining us this evening. Have a good week, and be sure to watch next week. It'll be fun. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program.